Well, that would be up to the uh, people in the society, but we would know from uh, the Mises uh, money regression theory theorem that money would originate as a commodity, but it would be up to the people to, in the society to decide what money they wanted to use. Probably in a libertarian society, there would be a tendency for one or at most a couple commodities to uh, be uh, the money in that society. Uh, if the competing currency were accepted by the society, it would benefit both the ones who produced it and the ones who accepted it, because otherwise the exchange wouldn't take place. He wouldn't be able to do that because the, uh, if there were a ruling against him and it were based on the correct application of libertarian law code, it wouldn't be up to him whether the, uh, the judgment was uh, uh, accepted by him. He couldn't, say, retreat to his own property and say, you can't come in here in that circumstances, the judgment could still be executed against him. Well, it, uh, a libertarian law code is a matter more of objective fact. It wouldn't depend on, supposing, say, someone were to say, uh, you have your laws against murder, but I didn't agree to that. I was perfectly all right if I want to murder some somebody. He wouldn't be able to do that. A libertarian law code doesn't depend on individuals' consent to the law. Uh, well, the social contract is an idea that you find in uh, mainly in uh, philosophy, philosophies of the 17th and 18th century, but there are some earlier precedent that claim either as a matter of historical fact or just as a hypothetical con construct, we can imagine people in a society getting together and forming a government and the claim would be the legitimacy of the government would derive from that agreement or hypothetical agreement. Uh, no, uh, I mean, this is an argument that many uh, libertarian theorists have written about, most famously, I suppose, Lysander Spooner, that the, uh, the for a contract uh, to be in effect, people actually have to agree to it, and people haven't agreed, say, to accept the Constitution or other federal laws. It's just... People have various theories of so-called tacit consent, but as uh, Robert Nozick says, uh, tacit consent isn't worth the paper it's not written on. Probably in the uh, further development of the subjective theory of value and the extension of of the uh, theory of the structure of production and also the unification by Mises of monetary theory and general utility theory. And uh, there have been further contributions, say, in uh, monopoly theory by Rothbard. He had a really uh, comprehensive knowledge, not just of economics, but of political theory, philosophy, and many other subjects. And he had a tremendous intellectual curiosity about all things. He was, he was constantly coming up with new ideas, and he was very enthusiastic about the new ideas he found. It was a great, always a lot of fun talking to him. Well, under a libertarian view, uh, you're 
not bound to accept any government that you don't agree to. So if you find yourself in a government you don't want to be in, uh, you have the right to secede from it, and that goes exactly. If you don't want any government at all, you can form your own society. A famous essay by Herbert Spencer in the first edition of Social Status called The Right to Ignore the State. This is, I think, the key principle behind secession. I think the government really doesn't have any right. The government is really an agency of predation on the rest of society. So the government really doesn't have any rights to property. Property can only be acquired by individuals or in separate free associations of individuals. So the main disadvantage of the government claiming to own property is it prevents uh, private individuals from appropriating that property and then also the government tends to mismanage the property since it doesn't have incentives to uh, develop it in an economic fashion. Anarchy is a, uh, a system of society without a government to which people are compelled to make allegiance and in an anar anarchist society uh, protection and defense and so on takes place through private arrangements. We can distinguish between uh, individualist anarchism which is based on private property ownership and other types of anarchism that are more of a communitarian kind that don't recognize private property, but those types get into difficulties because uh, they don't leave individuals free to make uh, cap what knows it calls capitalist acts between consenting adults, so that sort of anarchism tends to uh, change into a more coercive structure very rapidly. I think what Murray had in mind when he said that was that uh, Hans Hoppe's view depends on fewer assumptions, that uh, Murray's justification is based on uh, natural law ethics, but on Hoppe's view we can derive self-ownership and so on just from pure reason, just from thinking about certain necessities of, for communication with others. So uh, Hans Hoppe is claiming a purely logical derivation of rights. His starting point is that if we make any claim at all it has to be a claim that we can support by argument. As he says, you can't argue that you don't, you, there, you can't argue that you can't argue. So he thinks if this is the case, then whatever is required for conducting an argument is something we can't plausibly deny. We can't say, if, say, we need such and such in order to argue, we can't argue that we don't have a right to that because we would need that, whatever that is, to make the argument. And he claims that what we need are self-ownership and private property in order to argue. And that's the uh, stru essential structure of his argument. Yes, this is a performer contradiction. That phrase was introduced by a German philosopher, Karl Otto Oppel, who, who influenced Hoppe a great deal. A performer contradiction is one, uh, is a statement such that you're denying the statement 
shows or manifests the statement is true. Uh, for example, if I say to you in English, I have never spoken an English sentence in my life, that statement, since it is an English se uh, sentence, would show that my statement is false. Uh, his claim is that in order to argue, you have to be in control of your own body. You couldn't argue unless you were in control of your own body. So he says that if I say I don't own myself, my saying that presupposes that I do own myself. So that's the type of performative contradiction of the kind I explained in answer to your earlier question. His argument there is that given self-ownership, uh, uh, we need uh, property in order to argue. We need to have at least some place to stand on or be located. And he said there are two possible uh, ways we could get uh, property ownership, two theories. One is we could just get property just by claiming that we had it. Say, I say, this is my property. The other is some process of, of homesteading or acquisition of property by doing something to it. And he thinks, he says that the first sort is wrong because then we could just claim other people if you could just claim that uh, property just by owning it, you could cl claim other people and that would contradict self-ownership. So he says that the homesteading principle is the only one option available. Yes, the is ought problem is the very widely accepted claim, at least since the time of David Hume, the great uh, British 18th century philosopher, that an ought judgment doesn't follow from an is judgment or collection of is judgment. Just saying that something is the case doesn't enable you to uh, logically enable you to say what ought to be the case. So this is a sticking point for ethics because many philosophers think if you can't do that, if the is ought gap holds, then there's no way of getting any objective oughts, they would claim. If, they do, if the ought judgments don't rest on facts about the world, then they're arbitrary and there's no basis for them. The Federal Reserve system is just a way of uh, it's a way of enabling the banks in the United States to expand the money supply beyond the the money that's deposited in them, and it does this if a bank expands credit, say without a Federal Reserve system, without a central bank, then it would be uh, subject to runs by customers of other banks, and there's a limited extent to which it could follow a fractional reserve policy. But the uh, Federal Reserve uh, acts as a backs up banks in doing this, so it enables banks to expand the money supply, of course, under its direction without fearing runs on the banks. It, one, they're in most respects quite similar. They have a similar elitist view that uh, because they consider themselves uh, more educated or more qualified, more informed than the, pop the populace, that they 
should uh, government should be run by them. But one way in which they're different is that the progressives of the past uh, were very strong advocates of eugenics, where in this now is not the case now. Uh, eugenics is a bad word, but the, the, eugen the eugenics was very popular among the uh, early 20th century progressives. I would think that they need to uh, consider alternatives to the government. They probably do that because they think, however bad the government is, there is no alternative to it, so we just have to accept matters the way they are. But I think they should recognize that there are alternatives if they study libertarian theory, they'll find out more about this and one hopes that would get them out of the attitude you describe.